Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Mentor, a Siemens business with Kerry Robertson, who's going to talk today about circuit reliability. So, Kerry, we, when we think about circuit reliability, we tend to think of it only at the most advanced nodes, but as we start getting into new applications, safety critical type of applications, it's no longer just the advanced nodes, it's now into everything, and devices are being used longer than they were in the past in some markets. What is that to on the design side? Circuit reliability is, of course, important at advanced nodes, but it's actually it's important across all circuits. And designers have been wrestling this with this for, for years. Um, at the advanced nodes, you have smaller VTs, you have thinner oxide transistors, you have a lot more complexity, so that is obviously a concern. But across the overall IC space, whether you're at 22 nanometers, whether you're at 130 nanometers, you have to look at uh, reliability issues. Um, maybe you're taking these designs into automotive environments that are very hot, and very noisy, and high voltage, or you're looking for greater longevity than you've had in the past, and you want these ICs to be very reliable for 10 years, 20 years in automotive and manufacturing applications. And it's not just digital circuitry, right? It's also analog circuitry uh, and often sometimes mixed together with the digital circuitry. Absolutely. In fact, the analog designers are very, very concerned about not only the reliability, but the fidelity of that circuit and how they are going to operate in a, in a particular region. So, yes, across all design styles, across multiple nodes, you need to look at these reliability issues. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure. So, Kerry, what are we looking at here? Let me start off with where we started. And I want to start off by talking about traditional areas of chip sign-off that everyone has been doing for, for decades. Obviously, you're doing geometric sign-off with DRC. Um, you're taking circuit information with LVS, and you're taking circuit plus parasitic to go into timing and functional simulation. So there have been traditional areas of, of sign-off that we've always been uh, incorporating. More recently, as we looked at the reliability problem, we need to take several of these elements combine them together, take uh, pertinent circuit information, and bring that with geometric, parasitic simulation, and potentially even pattern matching techniques to provide new areas for reliability solutions. You've got a lot more things going on than you did in the past. You also have things like aging that you didn't have to deal with in the past, because some of these, these designs are being used for a lot longer than they were in the past. What happens in terms of sign-off? Do you have enough confidence, and how do you know when you are you have a good enough solution on what you're designing? Excellent question. As you mentioned, you've got design complexity. And first off is just the scale of designs. At every leading node, we're doubling, tripling the number of transistors. Even at legacy nodes, you're putting on different types of content. Uh, you're putting on analog, you're putting radios, in addition to the digital content that you're creating you're probably also dealing with multiple power islands. Um, even at legacy nodes, you're dealing with 5 volts and 50 volts in a variety of different voltage regions that add to the complexity and add to the opportunity for electrical failure that you want to check against. And then, as you mentioned, you want longevity, and you want this longevity to last within various types of domains now. If you're looking at automotive, that's going to be very high voltage. Uh, it's also going to be very hot, very noisy, uh, industrial environments, or if it's in a smart city, it's out on a lamppost somewhere. So you have different environments and different concerns about how this uh, circuit is going to operate over a period of time. These are also wildly different use cases for some of these designs too, right? So you think about a cell phone chip versus an automotive chip. Those are completely different worlds, completely different conditions. Right. Um, they have not only did, you know, different worlds, different conditions, different power sources, uh, one's off of a battery, one's all in an automotive environment, something out in a data center is plugged into a wall, so you have different sources of power, you have different heat dynamics, you have different noises that you, that you have to work with. So what do we do about that? What's the solution? Let's talk about some of the problems. And again, these are not new problems. These are circuit concerns that folks have had for, for a long, long time, uh, they become more prevalent uh, now with the complexities that we talked about. And we'll also talk about some of the techniques we're using. But first off, 
some of the common things that we're working on is first off is electrical overstress. Are we uh, ensuring that these thin oxide transistors aren't running against an inappropriate voltage? Electrostatic discharge, both with the HBM model and the CDM model. Uh, we want to be able to check and verify against that in terms of electrical failure. That goes hand in hand with latch up. And in fact, in these two areas, we see a lot of silicon foundries investing in techniques so that customers have access to sign off capabilities in the area of ESD and latch up. That carries over into even circuit constraints or analog best practices. Uh, there are techniques that individual companies would like to mandate across how their analog circuits are designed and, valid and verified. And certainly looking at noise and how to make sure that your circuits are robust against uh, various sources of noise, which can be different uh, across different environments, is uh, a key issue. And none of these necessarily is the same from one chip to the next or even from one use model to the next, right? So these things may be intermittent, they may be timed to uh, different uh, use models. So if you're using a device differently than mine, you may have different uh, electrical overstress than I might have. Excellent point. These are very design dependent. A little bit different than traditional sign-off, which is you look at geometric sign-off, every chip has the same DRC constraints. In this space, how a chip operates affects it greatly. The clock speed, the, the voltage is encountered, um, how hot it gets is very design dependent and affects these reliability issues in a very specific way. So it's very difficult to brute force and it's also very difficult to say one size will fit all. So what does this look like in the real world? What are real world examples of this? Let's start with ESD. Uh, here are a couple of examples where, again, not new problems, um, but they are more of a concern now and we have better techniques for addressing them. Here's a typical uh, electrostatic discharge um, issue and something that you, you need to check and verify against. Overall, here we have a pad connected to a buffer and along the way, we need this implemented with a resistor and a diode, in this case, uh, developed with, um, with a MOSFET. And that, all of these have rules, and that MOSFET has to exist within, say, a micron of a well. So standard type of, of ESD check, ESD concern. That was very easy to describe in words, but very difficult to capture with traditional techniques. What we need to do is bring several of these elements together, which is circuit information, parasitic information, and geometric information, to give designers a comprehensive way to look at this problem. Are we working just in three dimensions, or will we also have to think about uh, how these physical effects will manifest over time? You have to look at both. You have to look at, is your circuit reliable against a catastrophic electrical event, like an ESD, uh, uh, an ESD charge? as well as will it last over time in a hot noisy environment and that we're checking that the circuit is robust uh, against these conditions on a constant and continual basis. Another example I want to take you through is uh, again bringing in various elements of circuit information and now parasitic information. As I mentioned you don't want to do this brute force. Here is an ESD concern where I need to check the path from power to ground across the clamp, the pad, the back bias diodes, measure that resistance and validate that against a particular constraint. You think about a modern SOC, and this is a very complex problem. It's not just the power line, it's not just the ground line, but it's components of both. And rather than doing this brute force, you need some intelligence to identify just this path, calculate just these parasitics so that you're not uh, giving yourself an enormous computational problem. In the past, we used to solve a lot of this with margin. You can't do that anymore at some of the most advanced nodes because your power budget is actually shrinking all over the place. It's shrinking in the chip, it's shrinking in the uh, system, and you also have to now think about um, performance and what does extra circuitry uh, add to this. What do we do as a result of that? Excellent point. Uh, designers don't want to use margin to solve these problems. 
They want specific solutions that is smart about their circuit, smart about the operation, so they, they can best take advantage of their design and the process. A very good example is voltage aware DRC. The concept being you have different spacing requirements based on the voltages that are present within the design. Now, traditional ways of doing voltage, uh, voltage aware DRC is to have you, the designer, put in marker layers or put in text annotations of what that voltage is. Uh, it's very tedious, it's very error prone, it's also very brute force if you say, okay, this entire region is 5 volts or 50 volts or something like that. When we talk to designers, they say, I put a marker layer over this region, but these two nets will never switch rail to rail, but nobody knows that. We've got to bring in the techniques that are circuit and design specific about what is the true operating region, both from a min and max perspective, uh, of these particular lines and apply the appropriate rule. If we do that, we can be much less pessimistic, um, enable designers to take advantage of their margins and, and not throw it all away, um, and overall we're smarter about our verification. Kerry, you talked about full chip, you talked about a lot of the digital uh, side of things. What ha what's happening on the analog side? Let's drill down into that a bit. As you probably know, analog designers are extremely concerned about reliability, consistency, um, and they, for a long time, have been putting constraints in place to mandate that circuits are designed, laid out, and operate in a very, very specific fashion. Using some of the techniques that I talked about that include circuit information, geometry information, and even pattern matching, we're helping those analog designers uh, validate that those constraints are met. Take something like a, like a MOSFET, and you put that into a differential pair environment. Analog designers want to make sure that they're the same, that they're routed the same, uh, they have the same areas, potentially they even have the same parasitics. Um, so they want to do things like orientation checking and symmetry che checking. That is now possible by combining uh, several of these, uh, these EDA techniques. Another example that I like to use is an inductor. Here, uh, analog designers are highly concerned about the fidelity, about the performance of this, and in many cases, they want this inductor to be drawn the same, laid out the same, oriented the same, and even have the same surroundings. That is very difficult to check for just brute force across the chip. With these new techniques, we can find these circuits, uh, we can find the elements that compose them, how they're drawn, how they're oriented, use pattern matching techniques to also then identify the overall neighborhood to make sure that regardless of where this inductor is placed, it is oriented appropriately, it has consistent surroundings, and therefore you should have consistent performance across all placements. Kerry Robertson, thanks for a very interesting discussion. Thank you, Ed.